Grace and peace to all of you on this Pentecost Sunday. We are delighted to welcome you to this Presbyterian Kirk service. I am delighted to announce that our session uh, met this afternoon and it was agreed that we will, after all, uh, reopen the Kirk for worship uh, this coming weekend. That will be Saturday the 6th for the informal service and June 7th for the Sunday worship, and we hope that you will uh, be able to join us. Uh, a couple of things to remember uh, as we uh, get back together. As always, we want to be safe, and so we will continue to practice social distancing as you come. Uh, we are asking that all of you wear your masks when entering and when leaving the worship service. Uh, we will uh, be singing during the service, and you can take the mass down, of course. Uh, but as you leave, we ask you also to put them back on. Uh, masks will be available. If you do not have one, you can pick one up as you enter the kirk. Ushers will be helping with designated seating. We will have uh, the congregation spaced out in a way that will keep the social distance. Of course, there will be no coffee hour in our Hoffius Hall. There will be no passing of the plates for the offering. We will have an offering basket and you can drop your gifts in as you come and as you leave. You'll be receiving an email and a congregational letter outlining all of these specifics. And of course, there will be ushers to help you when we get together on the 6th and on the 7th. We do realize that some of you uh, may not feel comfortable coming back to service, and we understand. Um, so we will continue to provide these video services uh, for the next few weeks or months or however long is necessary. Uh, and you can view the services from uh, your own home, your own computer, your smartphone. Finally, we are asking all of those of you who are planning to come, if you could help us plan uh, by indicating uh, when you receive the email from the Kirk this coming Monday, if you could indicate that you plan to come and how many plan to come with you, and it will help us plan very much. Uh, the, the email will be kirkoffice1, the Arabic numeral 1, at sbcglobal.net. Hear these words from Psalm 104. How manifold are your works, O Lord! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your glory. Send forth your spirit, and they are created. And you renew the face of the earth each and every day. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will praise my God while I have my being. Let us worship together as we sing.
The text I've chosen for this Pentecost Sunday is from 1 John. Uh, not the gospel, but the first letter, the first epistle of John. There are three letters in the New Testament that are attributed to uh, a person named the Elder John. And all three of these letters, scholars believe, were written toward uh, the end of the first century, addressed to Christian communities somewhere, they think, in Asia Minor, which would be modern-day Turkey. Let us listen to these words from 1 John. Let us listen as the Spirit speaks to us still. The elder writes, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many have gone out into the world, and this is how we recognize the spirit of truth from the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among, revealed among us in this way. God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his Son for us. Beloved, since God has loved us so much, we ought also to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and God's love is perfected in us. This is how we know that we abide in him, because God has given us his spirit, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son as a Savior to the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is God's Son, and they abide in him. So we have known, and so we believe that the love of God is for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. Whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because God first loved us. Again, those who say, I love God, but they hate their brothers and sisters, they're liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And so we have this commandment from our Lord. Those who love God must also love their brothers and their sisters. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Grant us, Lord, eyes to see, give us ears to hear, and give us hearts, O oh God, that are open to the movings, to the power of your Spirit. Strengthen us, we pray, for Christ's sake. Amen. I'm wondering how many of you have ever been part of a church fight. I don't mean a fisticuffs, though that probably has happened before as well. We've heard about them, of course, but I'm wondering how many of you have ever been a first-hand witness to a church coming apart at the seams. If you have, you in fact know how very disruptive, how very painful they can be. And churches fight for all kinds of issues. Um, the very first church that I pastored when I was still in college very small Baptist church uh, in this state uh, was the result of a church split. Uh, before I got there a few years, another church had voted their pastor out. They fired him, gave him all of two weeks notice. He had to move out of the parsonage. Uh, he had a family. You, you can only imagine. A smaller group in that church thought that the pastor had been mistreated, that the congregation had not treated him fairly, and so they left. A group of about 30 left that church. Um, and they went about five miles down the road and they built another church. 
another Baptist church. Um, and this smaller church is the one that called me as a pastor about two years later. But I can tell you that the ripples, the fallout, uh, the pain of that church split uh, was still very real in that community. A small little town and Christians fighting and splitting. There were people when I got there that refused to talk to others. Churches do split over pastors, uh, but in fact, bad pastors even have uh, supporters. They have their friends, they have their allies. Sometimes it's money, uh, who decides where to send it, what causes to support, what missions to serve. The congregation I served in Kentucky a number of years ago had gone through a church fight. Uh, they didn't actually split, but they went through a very acrimonious fight back in the 1960s, which was 30 years before I was there. Uh, but if you can believe it, the fight was over whether or not to pad church pews. Some of the members argued that the old wooden pews were too hard, uh, too uncomfortable, too uh, too uh, painful to endure a worship service. Uh, they thought that if we padded the pews, it would increase the attendance. Uh, others in that congregation uh, believed it was a waste of money, uh, that the money could be better served if it was sent to some needy mission or cause. And the church argued about this. Uh, and then they did something amazing. They actually compromised. Uh, and they padded every other pew. Uh, I'm not making this up. They padded half of the pews in the sanctuary, and then, of course, they sat and watched uh, to see where people sat. And God help you if you voted one way and then sat in another. People sometimes fight about doctrines, but my experience is uh, more times than not, People fight about power. Who has power? Who has control? Who gets to make the decisions and gets their way? Uh, as we say, who gets to navigate and who gets to steer? That tends to be issues that Christians fight about. On and on and on. Uh, what kind of music we sing, whether hymns or choruses, whether organ and Bach or guitars and drum, the worship wars, we all know about church fights. The text I read uh, from the elder is in fact part of an ancient church fight. Uh, it's not exactly clear uh, in the verses that I read, but modern scholars are pretty clear that this this little letter is addressing problems within a congregation uh, 1,900 years ago. Uh, not problems brought on by outsiders, but people that are insiders from fellow Christians within this community. And now they're splitting. Uh, some are uh, claiming, both sides claiming to be right. Uh, both sides are calling the other names. Uh, in fact, this is the only letter in the entire New Testament uh, where in fact the spirit of Antichrist is used. And it's a way to label other people. Uh, people that don't agree with us, the elder says, are the Antichrist. Both sides claim to be the true community of the beloved disciple. Uh, we can only imagine uh, how painful that church fight must have been. The author, uh, the elder, does not address all the issues. It's hard, difficult for modern scholars to reconstruct exactly who the opponents are. Down deep at its root, this author seems to suggest that it's finally an absence of love. That is what is missing in this congregational fight. This is the only place in the entire Bible that makes this audacious claim that God is love. 
We read about the steadfast love in lots of places in the Hebrew Bible. We all know that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. We hear about the way God loves, but this is the only place in the entire Bible where it says God is love. And whoever knows God knows about love. The converse, of course, this author says, whoever does not love, in fact, does not know love. It doesn't matter what they say. Whoever says they love God and continues to hate a brother or a sister has, in fact, deluded themselves. They really don't know what they're talking about. First John says it's not enough just to believe that God is love. It's not enough for us to just confess it or to talk about it. Genuine faith, mature faith, this author says, has to practice love. Love is something that we do. We have to put it into our life. We can't just claim to believe in love. This is interesting, of course, uh, because we remember in the Bible in the New Testament especially, love is not a sentiment. It's not something we feel towards someone. Love is an action. It's something that we choose to do. It's the way we treat people or the way we do not treat them. Which is of course why we are in the New Testament commanded to love our neighbors. We're even commanded to love our enemies. We're not commanded to like them, but to love them. And that means, as Jesus says, to pray for them, to bless those who speak ill of us, speak well of them, to treat other people with respect and dignity. And of course, this means that you and I can love people that we might not even like. We can love people, all people, even if we don't much care for their company. Love is a commandment, it's a choice we make. If we say we love God, we have to love our brothers and our sisters, even in the midst of a church fight. Many of you have heard this poem. Um, I've seen it attributed to Mother Teresa. Uh, apparently uh, this was a poem that she had posted in her uh, Calcutta charity hospital. I've seen it attributed to the psychiatrist uh, Carl Menninger. And I've heard others uh, have claimed authorship. Uh, I really do not know where it came from. It's in many different versions, but this is the one that I like best. Listen to this. People are often unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you're kind, people will sometimes accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are honest and sincere, some people may try to deceive you and take advantage. But be honest and sincere anyway. The good that you do today may be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. People who need your help may in fact attack you if you try. Help them anyway. And finally, if you give the world your best, it still may not be enough. But give the world your best anyway. Powerful words, demanding words. Uh, in fact, maybe even impossible. If it were just up to us, if it was just up for us being good people or kind-hearted but the Christian faith teaches, finally, that we're not alone. It's not just up to us. The Christian faith has taught for 2,000 years that, in fact, we're not alone. That God has given us the Spirit, and it is this Spirit that strengthens and empowers us to go forth and do the things that we might not otherwise do. The author of 1 John wants us to know that if we abide in God's spirit, 
we will also abide in God's love. And this in part, I think, is what we celebrate on Pentecost Sunday. We celebrate this every day, the spirit of our God who abides with us and helps us, gives us the gifts and the fruit of the spirit that enable us to get along with people that we might not otherwise like. We're not on our own. It's not just up to us. It's the Spirit that helps us forgive when we might not want to forgive, to be kind and honest and sincere, to live with dignity, to do good, to be generous. The Spirit strengthens us to love God and to love our neighbor. It occurs to me that uh, this word that John uses, abide, uh, is an interesting word. We abide in God's spirit. And, and that suggests to me that this is not some magic pill. Uh, doesn't all come at once. Abiding in God is a, is a transformation that in fact comes uh, after some time, after years maybe of commitment and prayer, of opening ourselves up to God's transforming spirit. One final story. Many of you are familiar with uh, Maya Angelou, uh, her classic autobiography, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. That story tells about her early years growing up in the 1930s and the 1940s in Stamps, Arkansas. She was born in St. Louis, uh, but when she was three or four, her parents' marriage failed, and she was sent by train along with her brother to Stamps, Arkansas, all the way down on the border of Louisiana to grow up in a very small town in the 1930s and the 1940s. She tells this amazing story, the power and the peace of God's spirit. Uh, she tells about the day a group of white teenagers, young teenage girls uh, had come to the grocery store that her grandmother ran. And as her grandmother sat on the rocker and sat on the porch, uh, these teenage girls uh, acted terrible. Uh, they taunted and insulted the grandmother. Uh, Maya writes about all the nasty things and the names that they called her. How they laughed at her grandmother for being black. One of the teens even did a handstand so that her dress fell down and she was wearing no underwear and she was mooning the grandmother. And watching this, as a young girl, six seven years old, Maya says she, she was furious at seeing her grandmother humiliated. And she asked, why didn't she fight back? Why didn't she do something? But of course, as she got older, Maya realized that her grandmother in a southern town in the 1930s could do absolutely nothing but take it. But she didn't just take it. Maya says uh, her grandmother never said a word, never fought back, never insulted back. And as Maya moved closer, she said that she heard her grandmother singing the old hymn, Bread of Heaven, Bread of Heaven, Feed Me Till I Want No More. Now you read a story like that and you wonder how in God's name did a woman, a black woman in the 1930s get the strength and the courage and the dignity to put up with insults like that, abuse like that. My hunch is uh, that this is a woman of deep faith. This is a woman who drank deeply from the wells the faith, not a casual Christian by any means, but someone who knew what it meant to abide in God's love 
And it was that love and the Spirit of God that gave her the strength to do the right thing, to take the high road, and to love back. This is what we celebrate at Pentecost. This is what we hope and pray for, is that God's Spirit will strengthen us and help us to live faithful lives. Amen. Continue to be generous in their giving uh, to the mission and to the ministry of this Kirk. We thank you. And we also want to say a special word of thanks to all who have been so generous in our new Second Mile initiative. Uh, this is a new initiative of our mission committee, and it will go to uh, several designated mission partners uh, throughout the state and in our local area. We're only two weeks into this, and thus far we have already received uh, over $17,000, and we are grateful for your generosity. Let us offer our prayers. Merciful God, we gather now in your name, and we offer thanks for this new day. We give you thanks for the promise of your presence with us, and especially in this season of Pentecost, we're grateful for the gift of your Spirit. We're grateful, O oh God, for the assurance that your Spirit will continue to lead and guide us and strengthen us and help us as we face difficult days ahead. As always, we are mindful of those who are in need. We're mindful, O oh God, of all who struggle with this illness. We ask you to be with their families and be with those who care for them. We pray especially for you to be with those who grieve and who have lost loved ones. We pray too, O oh Lord, for uh, so many who have lost jobs and incomes, for the 40 million unemployed in this country, as well as the millions throughout the world. We ask that you would be with them, O oh God, 
that you would be with us and with all of those of us who can be generous with our time and with our talent. Be with all, O oh God, who call upon you this day and send your spirit to be a strength and a presence. Help us to be faithful, O oh God, for we ask this, the prayer that our Lord taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. your life as you seek to be faithful. Go in peace and do God's will.